Good afternoon and welcome to the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association's Social Housing Around the World webinar series, episode two. Today we'll be hearing from Housing Opportunities Commission of Montgomery County, Maryland, USA. I'm Dominika Kshaminska, Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives at CHRA, and I'll be your host for today. Thank you all for joining us. Moving on to today's webinar topic. In our second episode of the Social Housing Around the World series, Housing Opportunities, um, we're gonna be hearing from Housing Opportunities Commission of Montgomery County. Housing Opportunities Commission of Mon Montgomery County's mission is to provide affordable housing and supportive services that enhance the lives of low and moderate income families and individuals throughout Montgomery County. HOC assists customers in maintaining their housing while maximizing their quality of life and helping them attain the highest level of self-sufficiency possible by connecting customers to crisis intervention, financial literacy services, and site-based programming. In this webinar, HOC will present an overview of their service model, including hochousinghousingpath.com, an onboarding application for all HOC rental housing programs, and HOC Academy, home to HOC's resources, training, and support provided to adult and youth customers. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you our speaker for today. Stacy Spann is the Executive Director of Housing Opportunities Commission. Prior to joining HOC, Mr. Spann was the Executive Director of Howard County Housing, which includes the Housing Commission and the County's Department of Housing and Community Development. Mr. Spann drafted and implemented the county's affordable housing strategic plan, doubled the size of the housing unit portfolio, and engineered the county's first mixed income development. In addition to overseeing the Department of Housing and Community Development and Housing Commission in Howard County, Mr. Spann's background includes serving as the Assistant Commissioner of Development Finance in Baltimore from 2004 to 2006, where he managed and oversaw five offices. Mr. Spann was named in October 2010 as Affordable Housing Finance Magazine's Young Leader Award recipient. He's currently an adjunct professor of the Capstone Course Master's Program in Real Estate at the University of Maryland at College Park in the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. He's also a member of the Professional Development Faculty at the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Organizations, where he teaches Introduction to Mixed Finance for Public Housing Authorities. I'd like to uh, to welcome Stacey. Good afternoon. Um, Dominica, thank you so much for talking about um, HOC's mission. Um, we do focus on, on housing folks. What I like to say is that we have the ability to house folks and um, support them in their housing journey. And we do that sometimes with uh, a hard unit, a hard unit and some subsidy. And then, of course, the, the services that really connect people to community and keep them connected. And so um, instead of taking, you know, 30 minutes to explain all the stuff we do, as well as our structure, we really um, sort of to reorient uh, the way that we, we focus on customers. And so uh, the kind of three things that we do when we explain this um, kind of universally this way, we get people housed, we keep them housed, and we help customers reach their fullest potential. And so... Um, the reason that we're doing it that way is because it really should not matter what the customer's needs um, are and, and forcing them to find the, the right um, portal into, into the agency. What matters is that they've got the need and there's something that we can do um, that's measurable, that, uh, that, that really fits in one of those three buckets. And as we are working with customers uh, and attempting to help, help them reach their fullest potential, there are a number of, of areas that, um, uh, that allow us that, that opportunity to sort of measure how well or how poorly, quite frankly, we're connecting with, with uh, customers. We're, we're trying to become more of a performance-based agency so that we can measure um, how effective we are, how much we're reaching customers, and how well we're we're uh, connecting the community. So, um, just as as really really quick background, um, the agency has uh, seven commissioners. They're all volunteers. They are um, chosen by the county executive and then confirmed by the county council. But we are actually uh, a a state agency, um, and so we're separate and apart from county government, which gives us a real, really good opportunity to 
um, to sort of do things independently. While the county is our partner, we like to say that we are the preeminent uh, affordable housing provider in this in this county. And so this is how we're organized. Um, just want to go through it really quickly. I report directly to the board, and then I've got a number of um, directors or um, or chiefs who who uh, either chief investment or real estate officer, a chief operating officer, a chief technology officer, and a chief financial officer who report directly to me. Um, we've got a staff of somewhere around 365 persons. Uh, and we've got in this 500 square mile county, we've got four distinct offices, um, two are service centers, two are um, our offices where we see customers, but uh, m most of our folks are operating out of there with the exception of the property management and maintenance teams. So this county at um, almost um, 500 square miles has a population of over a million folks. So I've been here about seven years, and in that seven years, we have um, just over 8,000 units that we actually own and operate ourselves. Um, and a number of those are, are, are multifamily. And so we have a mixture of third party um, or privately managed properties. And, and then we've got a number of scattered site units that are located within communities throughout. And so this, this map kind of gives a sense of how broad our reach is. Um, and and then of course you'll see some some clustering um, and those are typically going to be areas where there are fair numbers of multifamily communities there's some transit there are sort of more metropolitan centers etc what's difficult uh, and, and you know is that the the median household income here is over a hundred thousand dollars perennially it's over a hundred thousand dollars and so what that means is it is while it's a relatively high income county uh, it is incredibly difficult to find um, rental opportunities for affordable housing. And, and so within the county, there are roughly 90,000 uh, rental units at 8,000, a little over 8,000, where you know, we're, we make up by ourselves um, a little less than 10 percent, which is um, which is pretty significant. Um, you know, persons in poverty around 6.9 percent. The median gross rent is about sixteen hundred dollars. Um, uh, U.S. And so that's actually pretty high. And we're right in the shadow of Washington, D.C., um, which which um, causes us some unique challenges, but also presents some unique uh, opportunities. So, so when there's a recession, and as an example, D.C. area tends to suffer a little bit less and come out of the recession much faster than um, most areas of our country. However, um, the high pricing uh, for, for land values, et cetera, from DC and Northern Virginia bleed over into this county pretty quickly. And so when we're acquiring property um, or redeveloping property, those, th those pricing things really cause um, a bit of consternation. Um, what's interesting is the county has recently uh, become a majority minority community. Um, we have a number of, of uh, former born residents who make up a lot of the county's growth. Um, the younger persons uh, are settling near um, really demanding um, transit nodes, particularly mass transit. And so we have a, um, a, a, a subway system um, um, and train system that is, that is not as robust as it could be, uh, but is growing over time. Uh, and that presents an interesting opportunity for affordable housing, but um, in particular mixed income um, development. And so um, what we also see moderate income and low income families uh, locating in the most affordable um, nodes, but they, some of those happen to be along transit routes. So we talked about kind of what we do, the three buckets, getting people housed, keeping them housed and helping them, um, helping customers reach their fullest potential. But you know, that boils down to us taking every single opportunity to connect with folks. And so we are, as we're develop, doing our development work, um, we're trying to improve the housing quality generally in our own portfolio, but also in the community um, that surrounds us. And we do that in order to make sure families are connected to communities and we're not uh, creating these, these um, sort of islands of, of very low income folks. And so every single property um, we develop um, has uh, a, a, an income mix. And it's, it's not simply moderate to low. We, we generally mix 
market rate on down. Uh, and we work really, really hard. So over the last five years, we've invested somewhere. Um, this actually, this number is a little dated, um, but it's 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 pushing closer toward 400 million. And this um, in the next five years, we've got a pipeline that's about another 400 million. And so, um, you know, we have uh, this actually this 556 units. That's net new. Some of those are under construction. Um, all of those units um, that actually understates it because we've acquired uh, in the last year even we've, we've acquired some, somewhere around 1100 uh, units and in four different properties and we did that because this county has a unique law that offers us an opportunity to sort of move with the market to preserve affordability um, what's the the real story of our development work though is um, is trying to take the age of the the um, the average age of a, of a property and reduce it, um, which really means in turn that we start to see savings from an operational and, and maintenance uh, and capital standpoint. Um, and, and that's critical because when we're having to replace systems and yet provide affordable rents, um, we're, we're having to balance, you know, so where we're able to, to make expenditure. When the systems are more energy efficient, um, they're newer, then we're not having to worry about the, the operating costs as much um, because they're lower, uh, nor are we having to figure out how to make the capital outlays uh, while managing other parts of our budget. Uh, and so every single time we're looking at a community, um, whether it's our, our, in, in our existing portfolio or something that we're thinking about acquiring, we're trying to make sure there's a connection. These are real assets that they're located near um, um, the strongest schools in this in this county. Uh, that they provide uh, uh, employment access, transportation opportunities for recreation. Sometimes we build those in ourselves, and and that they're real, really diverse housing options, but have local uh, social supports, food access. Um, so we don't want to build a, in a food desert, as an example, or buy in a food desert. Um, community organizations, green space, and then uh, commercial spaces. Now this last one, commercial spaces for local and, and small businesses is something that has really become, um, uh, we've become aware of in the last year and a half. And, and so as I push through here, we're gonna talk about how we're uh, interfacing with customers and, and how we're um, meeting mission. So I'll talk about the services and programs in the next slide. But what I want to uh, underscore is what that is leading us to do is interface with our customer in a, in a different way than we ever have before. So uh, we need to know more about the customers. We need to know more about potential customers and um, and how we can serve them, not simply in their housing journey, but um, how we can serve them in an effort to help folks become better educated, um, add some economic uh, mobility. Uh, to their to their lives and and just generally meet their their own personal goals um, for success and so um, we're we're working to do that through uh, some of these programs. The first is our, uh, our affordable housing development. I'll uh, turn through some of the uh, efforts, the development efforts that we've uh, undertaken recently, and give you some some sense of what's happening with those. But uh, we've got uh, an inclusionary zoning program here. It's the first in our nation, uh, and it's called the MPDU or moderately, moderately priced dwelling unit program. That's for it's a rental program, but there's also a for sale component of it. And those are for folks who are at 60%, 65% of, of area median and below. Um, typically, you can't really afford it if you're less than at, at, at 65% for purchase. Um, we, we build multifamily properties. I'll show you some of those. We acquire multifamily and scatter site rentals. And um, because we are also a local housing finance agency and are rated, we're able to issue uh, bonds for ourselves, for our own, our own development, but also other multifamily developments. That helps us generate fees, which we in turn plow back into the operation. Um, and it's an, it's an important point, um, but it also allows us to manage better the timing of, of financing uh, an effort and, and therefore developing it. Uh, which is, you know, incredibly valuable in a market that's that is this active for sales and purchases and just general development. Uh, the next thing is housing, uh, affordable housing management and maintenance. Well, we, you know, we're trying to manage, um, you know, the community norms 
um, and the relationships between homeowner associations and, and sometimes public housing residents, but also um, uh, residents who are using um, our low income housing uh, tax credit program and other subsidy programs. The next one is housing subsidy distribution and management. And so there we manage our housing choice voucher program, which is about a $90 million program for us annually. Um, it's, that's an interesting program because it allows, um, it allows the tenant um, to essentially ma make the market rate rent payment. Um, what's, what's a bit counterintuitive is that while we are uh, an owner and landlord, uh, only 10% roughly of that $90 million program actually comes to us as rents, to HOC as rents. The, the vast majority of it, 80%, 90% of it goes to um, private landlords who have, um, you know, townhome product, single family product of some type uh, and, and um, are renting to folks or even multifamily product. Um, in addition to that, we have some other um, sort of shallow housing subsidy programs, which um, help to, to keep people connected when they're uh, when they've encountered some some um, instability or some challenges. Um, we've, we have a single family uh, um, down payment assistance program as well as uh, single family mortgage programs because um, again as a housing finance agency we're able to issue single family bonds um, and um, uh, and issue mortgages um, in concert with the private um, banks uh, so that families can purchase homes in this county. Um, we provide services to residents uh, in any of our assisted and sometimes um, unassisted housing. And so that, you know, they're, they're counseling and supportive services. Um, we, I was literally just talking to um, a team member uh, this morning about how we need to get um, even more involved in that because what we're seeing uh, because of certain changes in the county is that um, we have, you know, a, a rising uh, number of, of customers who have significant mental health issues and when we place them in, into uh, housing opportunities um, you know we're finding that they they wind up getting uh, into trouble because they just they just you know they don't have the supports that they that are necessary to keep them connected um, and so the last one is our housing resource service and so what we're trying to do is provide um, up-to-date information uh, electronically so it's available 24 7 um, to uh, individuals who are interested. And so um, uh, I'll talk through some of this really quickly um, and give you uh, um, an overview of our services. So um, we really are focused on a couple things. One, trying to maximize the stability of customers. And that, um, you know, it, it, depending on where folks are in, in their life and what challenges they're having, it can be difficult. Um, but it can also be quite easy. It just really depends on what's going on. And so we, uh, our team is providing, uh, they do an assessment, they're in it, intervening, there's um, significant co consultation, some education, and even financial assistance. And it's really that way. We don't just give the financial assistance or a unit because we want folks to succeed and to, and to, um, to be stable. Um, we're always supporting folks in their self-sufficiency efforts. And so, um, the best way that we know how to do that, again, is not simply by providing someone a subsidy or a hard unit and walking away, but trying to figure out how to connect folks to uh, educational opportunities, deal with other uh, barriers or challenges, um, and, and make those connections so that folks can have stronger educational and employment opportunities, and not simply um, uh, the heads of household. We're now sort of uh, We've launched over the last three summers internship programs for college age students um, of our uh, of, of our um, heads of household customers. And we found some pretty good success there because we want to make sure we're, uh, we're we're working hard to change lives and, and stabilize an entire family. Uh, additionally, improving the quality of life. And so that, you know, is about um, our team advocating for customers, uh, coordinating the services, um, but also working with uh, the vast array of, of community programming in this in this county, and and uh, and supporting families that way. Additional services, we're you know we're working to you know connect citizens to housing again. Um, you know, there's a direct connection to housing units. Uh, some of those are rental, some of those are for sale. 
Uh, there's financial uh, assistance for rent and uh, utility arrears. Those are, again, shallow subsidies. They, they're not meant to be long-term. Um, and then we've got some other short-term rental assistance. And the way that we have sort of broken out to serve families is a little bit different. So in a 500 square mile county with communities of all different types, it would be extremely difficult for us to mobilize from the four offices um, and, and see folks. And then it would also be hard for some of those customers to come and travel to us. And so what we did was split our properties into this um, housing unit basis. Um, so we have, uh, or hubs, we have services uh, within uh, a two to seven mile radius of anything that we own um, for families and, and they can literally visit one of the multifamily properties and, uh, you know, and, and, and get um, resident services. We've got two service centers. Those are um, for uh, voucher holders, for landlords even, and for individuals who are having um, other challenges. We also offer some crisis intervention there. We offer assessment there. We also offer um, referrals and connection um, at those service centers. And, and then um, at the hubs, we offer some site-based programming and some disability services. And we're starting now to push um, more significantly financial literacy uh, supports and services in virtually every single program that we're, we're managing. So I talked a little bit about um, uh, our development work and, and noted that we spent, uh, we invested somewhere around $400 million in our portfolio and we expect to invest just under 400 million more over the next five years. And so we, um, you know, this Elizabeth Square is a development illustrative. And so, um, you know, we actually own um, this building here and uh, Alexander House, and and we are um, we have completely remade it. It's been completely um, uh, gutted and um, renovated. Um, you know that's a hundred million dollar cost to us. Uh, and this area right here in Silver Spring, Maryland, is literally right next to the red line. So this here is the red line goes into D.C. Uh, and so it is it's highly connected to jobs. Uh, and other op educational opportunities as well. Um, in addition to that, um, there's a, a purple line to be built um, train that's just blocks away from that. Uh, and so phase one was really um, reworking uh, Alexander House. Um, phase two is um, Elizabeth House. And, and the way that we got to this one is we partnered with a private developer and we essentially um, uh, uh, the structure is like a ground lease of their property. We, we took down their property um, and we bought the air rights. The, the, so we, we will own the improvement, but just below this is going to be a world-class, um, um, the South County Recreational uh, and, and Aquatic Center, and uh, as well as a, a senior resource center, primary care facility. So we're partnering with uh, a hospital to do that. And what, the reason we're doing that is because this whole corner here, was sort of the the area that that time forgot um, before we before we started to do this work. Um, the rest of Silver Spring here was being built up, and you know we had really our first um, public housing uh, technical public housing property um, right here on this. It's, it's actually exists where this building um, uh, will be, and so uh, we just you know thought, all right, let's reimagine this entire thing, open it up and really connect it to the broader community. And so we've worked um, tirelessly to get this underway. As I said, this building's almost done. This building will start um, construction within the next 45 days. And then we're working to finance this. And there's an entire rebranding of this whole thing. Uh, so it's called Elizabeth Square because uh, we're, we're uh, it's a nod to our first public housing development. But um, each of these buildings will have its own distinct market presence. Uh, so this will remain Alexander House. I have the name of these two, but um, unfortunately, uh, I can't release it to you yet. I'd love to, to tell you. Um, but you know what you can do if you're ever in the area, you, you can come and see it and maybe you'll swim in that pool or hang out in that, uh, that recreational center. So then I'll move to our next one, which is 900 there. Um, this is just a project name. This one we bought to Land Bank, but we embarked on um, something called uh, the Rentalist uh, Assistant um, Demonstration. 
through HUD. And so we essentially have decoupled ourselves entirely from the technical uh, U.S. public housing program and converted all of these, um, uh, all of those units. We had about 1,800 um, um, into ownership. And truth be told, there's really 1,100 left. We did a, a combination. We did a Section 18 demolition disposition um, application. We're approved for that. And the rest of them we did through RAD, the rental assistance demonstration effort. And so this property is a receiving site. Um, it's a replacement housing for some of the uh, RAD units. And so we acquired it in 2016. Um, it was already entitled. Um, and so uh, it, was all, it was designed as a market rate rental effort, but um, just the, the economics of it wouldn't work given the cost. Uh, it's about 124 units. Um, and it's going to be mixed income, but, but you know, we're working to do, we're, right now we're layering in 4% credits, tax credits to fund it. Uh, and so we've got a little bit of work to do on it. Um, it is, uh, at this point, I feel like it's 65% done. Um, and, and so this is also in Silver Spring. This is Hillendale Gateway, uh, another one where we're transforming a public housing, um, a former public housing site. Um, which it technically is here with this, it exists now here where this building will be. Um, we had 96 units there, uh, there were, there were housing seniors. It, you know, we just had not made any significant investment in it. Um, as you all know, uh, it was verboten up until the point of, of, um, RAD, uh, the rental ass uh, assistance demonstration project. It, it's verboten to mix technical public housing capital with um, with other forms of capital. The only exception to that was Hope Six, and there was just a limited um, number of resources for Hope Six. And so, um, we have partnered again with the private sector and are bringing this out of the ground. Um, uh, and and so, extremely excited about it because we uh, the, the the unit count. You know, we've densified it you know, far beyond this 96 unit. We found um, recently a, a construction um, effort that will allow us to get it out of the ground faster, more, you know, much more efficiently and much cheaper. And so we'll preserve the 96 affordable units, uh, deeply affordable units and, and add additional. And, you know, we're going to build um, in this, what's the first ever net zero building in this, in this uh, net, net zero residential building. Um, in this, uh, you know, in this region. And so we're super excited about this one. It should get underway uh, within the next year and a half. Uh, there's been a lot of planning um, to get to this point. So that's, you know, that's how we're engaging in, in some of our development work. What's, so I'll move on to customer engagement and, um, and tell you the story of Housing Path. So we have um, developed proprietary software um, that is an onboard uh, it's an onboarding application for all of our rental programs, um, and and ultimately we'll we'll you know we're bringing them all on um, over time in a way that that allows us to do it responsibly. Um, but it it first began as a way to register for the waitlist uh, for Housing Choice Voucher, and we had you know we had closed our waitlist, had it closed for seven years running. I got here and determined that you know the waitlist is not simply a tool for um, um, kind of warehousing names, but really is, an, is a way to uh, try and understand what customers and potential customers are demanding uh, or needing of, of us as an agency and a partner. And, and, and if it's closed, well, first thing is when we do have openings on, uh, and on the voucher registry, um, we would have to send out six times the number of actual openings we had. So uh, as a quick example, if we had six slots come open, um, six vouchers come open, we would have to, to go out to 60 folks in order to um, find um, uh, the appropriate uh, tenants who could be awarded those vouchers. And just because the information was stale, uh, we kept it in, you know, this closed Excel file. We, you know, we're completely missing out on an opportunity to interface with customers and find out more information about them so that we could serve them better. And so now um, we've created this tool. It it's perpetually open. Any applicant can log in and update their information at any time. But it forces every single year um, 
a, a login. So it's self-purging. It forces folks to log in and recertify in order to remain on, remain on the wait list. Uh, and we do that because uh, contact information may have changed. The family um, uh, background may have changed. There, you know, there, there are any number of demographic characteristics could have changed as well. Their desires about where they want to live in the city, uh, I'm sorry, in the county may have changed. And so we want to capture as much of that information. And the reason why is because even if we don't have a voucher opportunity, we may have a rental opportunity that can work, right? And so that is an amazing opportunity to not just interface differently with customers, but also to know more about the folks we serve. Where do people, uh, you know, really want to live in this county? And then, you know, we could follow up with why, what services do they need? Uh, you know, what are we not providing? The occasional survey about how, how well or how poorly we're serving folks. Those are important. So there are two portals. Uh, there's the applicant portal and the management portal. The applicant obviously uh, is the information step by step, very quick process that allows the it guides the applicant through um, registering. And then the management portal allows uh, staff to filter applications um, to identify potential customers based on you know the, the voucher availability or unit availability. It also allows us to run statistical and demographic reports. Uh, to, to try and figure out the real time demand uh, in any of those areas. Um, in addition to that, we've been building out multilingual functionality, um, some disabilities features as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, here very quickly are some of the some of the benefits of it. You can access it from anywhere. Um, and so it, it really does, um, you know, there's this critical automated follow up that, that happens just extreme efficiency because it's one wait list and you know when we're building out a new uh, a new property or a, um, when we're building out a, a low-income housing tax credit property we can actually have in addition to the overall list we can have uh, a wait list for for distinct properties as well and so I've kind of talked about this I don't want to um, go back through this again but I'll give you some of the points that we've been able to consider so right now we've got just under 30,000 current applicants all right um, we serve somewhere around 30,000 families, um, uh, 30,000 individuals right now. And so we've got as many applicants as we have um, customers. Uh, literally, you know, somewhere around one sixth of those families, a little under that, report a disability. That's valuable information. You know, eight, 883 families report veteran status. That, that allows them to potentially uh, access other resources that we that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access, but we know it from the very beginning. Um, you know, uh, 7,300 families are showing uh, medical vulnerability or homelessness. Again, accessing other opportunities um, that are not uh, a direct voucher. Um, 412 of those families completed completed the application with assistance of of a caseworker. Now that is an interesting statistic, right? Because it starts to tell us um, that there might be literacy challenges. And so how can we combat those, those things? 4,000 uh, of those are senior households, super important. Now of the uh, um, just under 30,000 applicants, 18,441 currently live or work in Montgomery County, which gives them additional scoring points for the voucher program. This is all powerful information because it helps us uh, serve customers in, in, a, in a more direct way. And, and so then here's another shade of that, right? Folks are telling us the number of bedrooms that they want. We have mostly two bedrooms followed closely uh, by one bedrooms and then and then finally by three bedrooms. And this is important because the market um, uh, is saying that, you know, a one bedroom and a junior bed is, is, an, is sufficient for most of the families. Well, we're finding out, nope, actually we need to have in our stock, um, you know, two bedrooms because these families are, you know, around two or three persons. That's typically what it means. Uh, and then this is all self-reported income. And so the, the very um, most of our families um, are reporting that, and they're self-reporting it, that, you know, they've got incomes that are at 30% of, of the AMI. Okay. Again, AMI for the county is 100,000. Washington Metropolitan uh, median income is going to be a little higher than that, somewhere in the I think 110,000 range. And so these are folks who who really have significant affordability issues. 
followed by people who are in the 30 to 50 percent of area median range. Now, this this is our you know this is clear um, clearly the demand numbers. We have to figure out how to provide high quality housing opportunities for persons who are in you know the sort of 50 to to um, down to zero percent income range, right? Huge challenge. So uh, another layer of this would be what kind of family sizes. And so um, here's other shades. Self-reported again, people are saying this is where they want to live. Now this is important. You all don't know much about these submarkets, but I, I I do. And what it says is the mo most of the people want to live in Silver Spring. This is a huge job center, but also a transportation center, and, and proximate to uh, any number of things, right? And so it starts to um, dwindle from there, but the highest scoring ones are areas that have uh, the train as transit, all right, that southeastern quadrant of the county. Um, really super important. So then we that information is powerful, but then we have other ways uh, to, to think about how we're, how we're um, integrating with folks. So we've got a couple of programs that you know, really allow post-secondary and employment pathways. And you heard me talk about that 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 um, number two thing, which is keeping people housed. So you got to have a job, or there ha has to be some level of income or connection to keep folks housed. In addition to that, is the third um, uh, bucket, which is um, helping folks reach their fullest potential. And so that is going to be generally an educational or employment opportunity or series of opportunities. And so. This family self-sufficiency is a is a it's a federally funded program. It's a relatively small program for us, and so as we thought about it, we we did a couple um, pretty extraordinary things because it it had there's case management, there's life skills training, there's education and workforce development training as well, and then there are these escrow accounts that folks are um, essentially building uh, wealth in, uh, and and upon graduation. Um, those folks are able to, to use that capital to buy a home, start a business, do any number of things. And so we started this program here in 1993. We significantly retooled it um, three and a half years ago. We've had over 2,000 graduates um, or, or, or en enrollees. As of uh, 2018, we've had um, 954 graduates, right? And so um, that is a little less than... Um, I mean, we've got less than half of those folks who are, are, are graduating. So some folks kind of stayed on the rolls. And so that was one of the things we noticed was that people were, um, they were happy to participate in staying on and extending their time period. It's, it's a five to seven year kind of program. Um, and and then what was happening? And so there is there's a piece there that, you know, if you just look at the data, we were clearly missing uh, a connection. And, and who knows why? Because we never asked the questions. We were just sort of checking the boxes and doing what the governmental program asked us to do until three years ago. And then we started to ask ourselves pretty significant questions. So 145 of the 954 graduates um, were home buyers. Okay, that that is, um, you know, that's not a phenomenal number. So you, you got to ask yourself, what happened to those other 700 some um, graduates? And here is the thing. What we found was that somewhere around 80% of, of graduates, right, 80% of graduates were at, um, kept a, a housing choice voucher at the same level or a greater level. And so that, what that tells us is there is something missed in this, you know, this, this, um, this, this training, right, and these services. There's something that we're, we're missing here. And so we, it led us to retool it um, and, and um, think about it much more differently. And so, you know, now we're thinking, okay, how are we measuring this stuff, right? And quite frankly, is our team qualified and let, to, to, to intervene in, in folks' lives and, and help them um, improve themselves? And if they're not, maybe they shouldn't be on the team. Um, and so for the participants, Again, you've got to be a voucher or public housing tenant, right? Uh, and there are a number of uh, application requirements. Those are fine, but what outcomes are we really trying to find? And so that this is where we start. It starts to get interesting, and we had to actually look at ourselves in the mirror and say, "Look, we we haven't we've had these soft goals for folks. How about we actually challenge folks and be very intentional about 
our interaction with them. So let's let's get a 70% graduation um, rate. All right. Now on 2,000 folks, you know, 70% graduation looks really different. Right. And so that's an important thing. All right. Let's reduce and, and eliminate the housing dependency. So that's the housing choice voucher. There's only one way to do this. And that is folks have got it and, and you know, really enhance their educational opportunities. Uh, and then um, as a direct consequence, their employment uh, or entrepreneurial opportunities. And so we've got to help in that. Right. And then and then these two things typically correlate to a direct increase in earnings uh, and then start to build, help folks build partnerships themselves um, by providing services, employment partners, uh, and then some, some mental health fitness. We have to actually recognize that that's a challenge. And, and you know, let's be, again, intentional about it. And then examine and retool how we're mentoring folks, okay? And so now, you know, we actually are, are managing folks. So we've got, you know, 229 um, active participants. So what we did was shrink the number of active participants. And, and we did it because um, I gave a directive to jettison folks who were not um, who were not meeting their, give them an opportunity for cure. But if they weren't willing to um, work on themselves and invest and meet the milestones, um, after that cure period, you know, we just roll them off. Let's not fool ourselves and, and, and artificially inflate the numbers. Um, and so we've gotten now uh, in, the, in the last little while, 92 new enrollees, 172 of those uh, of this uh, 229 are employed. That number in and of itself is huge improvement from a percentage standpoint. 47 are enrolled in a training uh, or education program. Okay, and so here we go. Now we're starting to see some results. 53 participants have reported increases in earned income. One successfully uh, obtained a GD, that's high school equivalency. 32 received training certificates. One got uh, an associate's degree, so that's two years of college. One uh, received a bachelor's degree, that's uh, um, full college, and one received a master's degree. And so, you know, now we're, you know, we're skinning down the number of graduates, um, but the level of quality that we're able to give them is a, an entirely different thing, right? Two of these 16 graduates are homeowners, three were over income. What that means is they're not requiring any housing subsidy. So now what we've done is upstream some families, all right, and allow space for folks who are on that wait list. We, we then thought, hmm, how do we improve on this? And so we had the audacity to, as a housing authority, to apply to the Department of Health and Human Services, and we're the only housing authority to date uh, that, that has been awarded the, the Fatherhood Initiative. It's called a New Pathways for Fathers and Families Grant. Um, and so we started off slow. This one was like we were not hitting the milestones at all. And so the whole point is to strengthen positive father-child engagement, improve employment and economic mobility opportunities, and improve healthy relationships um, and, and marriage. And so this, again, is an opportunity to engage with folks differently, this time men, a population that we often leave out of this stuff. And so, you know, there's communi direct communication skills building, character building, interpersonal relationships, economic stability, ways to, you know, working with folks to help them learn how to, um, uh, in a helpful way, uh, resolve conflict. And, you know, we have a stream of partners to help us do this as well. Um, and so, you know, here are some of the benefits, uh, right? So we've got 24 dad curriculum, case management, uh, we've got tuition assistance, um, financial literacy classes, we, you know, men and women's health, right? Um, how to how to really have a relationship with children. Some of these are, um, some of this is uh, anti recidivism work, um, uh, referrals for employment, and then we have graduation. So here are our stats. As I said, we started off slow, uh, and so 2016, you know, we had a, a you know 75 person enrollment target. We had 24 um, percent. Um, enrollment and then we just we've grown that so we're you know we're now growing it and it's mostly through word of mouth but mostly what we found was that this was a space we didn't know much about dads males were reticent to be a part of it uh, because you know they thought they'd be judged and they weren't going to get a, a lot of bang from it and so we have also connected this to um, some workforce training efforts that we're doing in the construction trade when you're you know we're, we're now starting to tie the work that we're doing so when you invest $400 million in an economy, 
uh, and it's around building trades, well, you can actually um, be audacious and ask for stuff like, you know, hey, uh, it'd be interesting to see if we have applicants, you know, who want to get trained and want to start participating in some of these um, trades and then entrepreneurial opportunities. So then we'll, we'll turn to resident services and some of our senior programs. So we have seven senior communities and they host a, a variety of programs for folks who are 60 um, to uh, years of age or better. Um, so we're collaborating with somewhere around 35 organizations and we're offering all sorts of accessible programs and services. Again, promoting self-sufficiency, health, wellness, and socialization, which is a really, really, really big thing. Um, so we've had somewhere around 350 seniors participate in programs um, to date. We actually have something called a senior prom. And, you know, we it's a, an opportunity to engage with seniors at some of our properties and, and really have them get dressed up and, and you know, just be social so that we're, we're not having folks kind of hang out in their apartments all day um, and de-socialize. Um, we focus on arts efforts, health and wellness, um, educational workshops and classes, and we also have a, a senior nutrition program. Uh, and so the one thing I did not talk about uh, is, is and because I want to really give you full time to ask whatever questions, is um, our, um, it's something called uh, HOC Academy. And, and so that is, we've rolled in a number of other programs and are starting um, to very aggressively uh, market that to uh, young adults on through um, middle aged adults and, and repackaging all of our uh, resident services uh, so that we're we're helpful. So that's one thing that we've you know really started to work on over the last two and a half years. And in addition to that, this work um, and much of this engagement and fatherhood initiative and family self sufficiency has led us to the conclusion that we ought to be partnering with in some cases and in other cases going on our own to um, to establish and maintain um, business incubator relationships so that uh, we really can help folks pursue entrepreneurial dreams and make sure they have the pr proper licensure, use our buying power to help um, to buy down the, the, the cost of supplies for folks, um, give them an opportunity to sort of um, practice and master trade, uh, you know, and, and incorporate some of that entrepreneurship into our, pardon me, into our development work as well. So with that, um, I'm going to take a quick sip of water and uh, Dominic, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, be more specific about stuff or, or whatever. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stacy, for for sharing the, you know, the fantastic work that HOC is doing out in Montgomery County. I think we'd need probably an entire day to to hear about to hear about all of the projects in detail. Um, it's, there is a lot. Uh, and I know that on your website, you also have, um, I think you have some some additional additional information about a lot of these projects that people, if they're interested in, uh, can can access, correct? Absolutely. We have it on the website. Um, and then we also have uh, a public facing YouTube channel as well. Uh, and we're starting to post more content to that. And, and uh, we're pretty active on social media. Great. Um, and people can access that through your website, right? Absolutely. Okay, great. So um, I'd like to open the floor now to any comments or questions from, from the audience. Um, so if you have questions or comments or anything for uh, for Stacy, please type them in the dialog box on your control panel if you haven't already. We do have a couple. So um, Stacy, if you're ready, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the first question, which comes from Sabrina. And Sabrina asks, uh, how, how does your organization, how does HOC access the incredible amount of uh, capital dollars that are required for your developments? What's development work. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for that question. Really appreciate it. Um, so there are a couple ways. The, the capital stack for development is going to consist typically of uh, a couple things. There, there's subsidy, like low-income housing tax credits and some state subsidy. And, and then there's going to be something, um, you know, there's going to be some bonds uh, that are issued. So we're able to, we're rated um, investment grade. So we're able to issue our own bonds uh, and we do that pretty frequently. Um, and we, you know, we tap conventional sources. This is the beauty of mixed income development. Um, it's also hard. Um, so we tap the, uh, you know, traditional conventional um, debt sources. We're now starting to tap 
um, equity sources. We have, in some instances, um, invested our own equity because you know it's it's sort of pent up in the land. So we'll do something called like a seller note, um, things that structures like that that allow us to pull capital out and then put it right back into the development. Um, uh, again, the 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 long term housing tax credits is a a pretty big one for us. Um, uh, and um, we've now begun to use private equity um, in a pretty significant way uh, over the last, call it, two and a half years. So, um, so the, yeah, that's out. Okay, thanks. Um, next question is from Yusuf and asks, how do you manage current tenants when redeveloping a housing site? So, for example, uh, relocating to temporary yeah. housing. Yeah, that's a so that is a phenomenal question. One of the things for you heard me mention the rental assistance demonstration project for HUD. It required um, in order to, to embark on that, you had to have at least one or two community meetings. Uh, and and so we had eleven separate rental assistance demonstration transactions. Um, we bundled um, uh, six of them, but. For, for each, for that entire portfolio of 88, we had over 100 community meetings. And so we were committed to, to um, identifying opportunities for folks. Uh, and so sometimes what we did was there are a, a number of strategies. If, you, if folks are moving, <clears throat> then we offer them the opportunity to come back. Um, if folks did not want to come back, um, we partnered with private sector uh, and essentially bought, quote unquote, bought the right to um, uh, certain rad units um, within their new development. So people are winding up in really nice communities um, that are rental, that are high quality um, and, and, and extremely desirable. Um, <clears throat> still other folks, we, um, we would lease down uh, to call it 60% and leave like 40% of the units um, unoccupied so that we could work in a stack or in a floor um, and, and get all those units rehab, then move people um, out of a, a stack or a floor uh, into the into the newly renovated one, and then start um, the one we had just uh, um, from which we just relocated. So there are a number of strategies, tactics that we employ to get it done. It really is is very transactionally specific, um, but uh, you know we try and deal with folks with respect, um, meet them where they where they are and need to be, and then um, and present a, a series of options that you know, are mutually beneficial. Okay, um, thank you. The next question is from Jackson. And Jackson, <laughs> Jackson asks an interesting question because when you were when you were talking about the uh, the HOC housing path dot com, I was thinking of something similar. <laughs> He's asking, um, is, is that a program that's for sale or something that we could purchase or a similar database? I think it would be fantastic for a lot of uh, a lot of um, yeah, this is, here, but how did you get it started? What was the maybe you can go into a little bit more detail about absolutely. the process yeah. there? Yeah. So, um, I mean, here's how the real way it started is I asked a question about demand and no one was able to tell me. I asked another question about our wait list and no one was able to give me any information. And so I like dreamed it up in the middle of a meeting. Like it needs to be open 24 seven. Here's how it needs to look. Here's a level of security. And then we contracted with a private developer um, to spec it out, um, uh, build a straw man, you know, go through extensive testing, um, rework, test again, rework, and then like here's our launch date, and we took it live. And I, I got to tell you, I had, uh, you know, because mail is, is, you know, we mail packets to folks, we mail, you know, we mail all this stuff about waitlist to people. It, it's really expensive. And most of the stuff comes back. So we've paid for the postage and we have to shred it. And, right. you know, and I have commissioners who um, some of them are way more seasoned than I am. And so they, 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 they had a thing about mail, you know, not everyone will be able to use it. And so what we did was, um, you know, we, we built it so that it functions on a mobile platform. So people have mobile phone or, or iPad or, or Android or whatever it is. And um, and we just have been testing it and and you know improving it, improving it over time. So in terms of is it for sale? Um, there's another couple modules that we're developing. Uh, and yeah, I mean the 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 fact of the matter is we are um, open to those conversations. Um, we 
uh, work with or are planning to launch an initiative around that and work with uh, housers all over to um, to integrate it, um, figure out exactly what their needs are. There's always going to be, you know, everybody tells you something is out of the box. That's all nonsense. There's always a level of customization. The, and the only reason we know is because, you know, we tried to buy another software for this purpose and it just was not robust enough. Um, and so we just built it ourselves. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I have, uh, I have before I ask the next question, I just want to remind the audience that if uh, if you do have any other questions, just type them in the dialogue box. We have a couple more minutes to uh, to ask Stacy some questions. So the next question comes from Noel. Noel asks, do you uh, do you incorporate dedicated supportive housing in your projects, or do you allocate some units in each project for supportive housing? Um, it depends on the development, and okay. so so. Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. It really depends on the development itself and what we're replacing. If we're building from new, it um, you know who the partners are, what supports are needed, um, it, you know that the population that's there. It just it really depends. It's transactionally specific. Okay, so you do have some projects that are all supportive housing then, and others no, that are just. Well, we don't have anything that's a hundred percent. Because we do, we, we do mostly, um, you know, we do mostly uh, mixed income, but mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, yeah, we de we certainly offer supportive housing options within mixed income developments. Okay. Uh, and, and you know, let, I want to be clear. Sometimes there are real challenges um, in in managing that. So, and, and we don't get it right 100% of the time. For sure. All right. Well, it looks like uh, I mean I'll, I'll talk slowly. So if any other questions come in, I'll uh, I'll definitely ask them. But uh, it, it looks like everyone has exhausted everything that they they'd like to ask. And, sure. and if there are any other questions that come up, um, is there someone I can direct them to at each of yeah, Me or Nico or even Ian. I mean I, I you know um, I see those guys every single day, and we're you know in constant touch. And so I'm happy to answer them. Um, as quickly as possible and then be as whatever help I can. Okay, so if anyone has uh, any further questions, they can send them my way and then I'll forward them off to uh, to Stacy and his team. So I'd like to um, say that that's, that's all the time that we have for today and I wanna uh, give many thanks to from all of us here at CHRA to our audience for participating and to Stacy for presenting. Um, today's webinar recording will be shared on CHRA's website in the coming days. You'll also be emailed a survey about today's webinar that will help us here at CHRA with future webinar programming, including future episodes of the uh, Social Housing Around the World series. Um, if you want to hear more from fantastic speakers like Stacy and the HOC, be sure to register for CHRA's e-newsletter, which provides information about upcoming webinars, among other things. So that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stacy, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Take care, folks. <laughs>